Hi, I'm Miss Sloan, and this is a video for my AP Biology students. This is chapter 45 for us, Community and Ecosystem Ecology. And I'm gonna make myself a little bit smaller. And for those of you that are new to my notes, um, down in the descriptor of this video, I have the group shared notes that are for my students. Two columns. Column one is a scaffolding. I'll help you fill it in. And column two, I encourage my students to throw in pictures. So we are coming to a close of our AP Biology year here on Chapter 45. And this is a link right here to the expectations from the College Board. And I also have them listed here. I encourage you to pause just for a minute and read through these um, expectations. I'm gonna take this particular chapter and break it into two videos. Um, there's a lot of pictures in here and I'll try to move quickly through the slideshow and make sure that we understand everything. So we're gonna start with 45.1 Ecology of Communities. Let me keep going here. And I wanna start with this picture. And what do you think is happening here? So so you've got some sort of two, you know, you have two carnivores and are they one hunting the other? And it turns out they're actually hunting together. So what's happening is that the coyotes and badgers are working together to hunt prairie dogs. So um, in this picture in the top right hand corner, in just a second, I'm going to get a, um, a pointer. There we go. You can see there's a prairie dog right here watching them. And what happens is the coyotes are a lot faster and they can chase the prairie dogs above ground. But then when the prairie dogs go down in their holes and the badgers are better at digging, so they work collaboratively, even though they're in competition with each other, they have better odds if they work together. And sometimes one gets a meal and sometimes the other. So when we talk about, there's a link here if you'd like more, learn a little bit bit more about that. When we talk about ecology of communities, um, we're going to be talking about um, different, uh, different populations that interact with one another in that same environment. And they're going to vary in size and their boundaries are hard to determine. They're going to overlap a little bit. And we're going to talk about, let's say in a coniferous forest, you see a list here of species, squirrel, moose, snowshoe hare, um, etc. This doesn't paint the full picture, right? Because we don't know how many there are of each of these organisms, right? And so it doesn't tell the abundance of each and it doesn't tell the density of each. So when you look at species on your notes, when you look at species richness and composition, you want to have more than just a list. And so in order to look at that um, di diversity, composition and abundance, we use something called Simpson, Simpson's Diversity Index. And this is your equation right here. And when you do this, you're taking the sum of how many you have of one species, that is N, the total number of organisms um, of a particular species, like how many monkeys you have, and you're dividing that by how many total species are in that area. You square that and you add it with the next one, okay? And so what this number will tell you is it represents the probability that two individuals randomly selected from a sample will belong to two different species. The higher the percentage, that the higher the um, index, then that's the higher probability that they will be from two different species, which is telling you you have high diversity. All right. So I want you to try this right now. So what is the, and this is very simple, obviously, what is the diversity index of a square kilometer that contains five anteaters, a hundred beetles, 10 monkeys, and two sloths? Okay. So remember, you're going to need to add these up together to get N, the total number of species. And then you take each one of these Put it over the total number, square it, and then do the next one, then do the beetles. So pause me just for a minute, and then I'll go over it with you. You pause? All right, so here we go. So I did the calculations for you. So I just added up, and this is one of the equations you need to know, right? So um, I just added them up and I had 117. That was my total number. So when I want to calculate the diversity index, it's one minus 
the sum of each of the individual species over the total squared, and I did that for you here, and then I added those four values up, and it came out to 0.739. So 1 minus 0.739 is 0.261, which means the probability that any two individuals randomly selected from this sample will belong is only 26%. Okay, that they would be from two different species. Now, this was very simple just so you could practice the math. You're going to have a lab that will allow you to practice it a little bit more, but you want to be familiar with this equation. So on your notes, you have species diversity is beyond just composition. It includes, this is what you need for your notes, little letter A, includes relative abundance of each species. Includes relative abundance of each species. And then for B, diversity index, it represents the probability that the two individuals randomly selected from a sample will belong to different species. It will belong to different species. So another thing we look at when we look at community structure is you look at island biogeography. So when you study islands, all right, so take a look at this graph. Just take a moment. All right, so you can see number of species and you can see rate of immigration. So what this graph, if you're just analyzing the two axes, right, that the number, the amount of immigration you have moving into that area decreases as the number of species increases, right? Which means that there's not a lot of room, right? All the niches are filled. If you have a bunch of species in one area, you're probably not going to get new species coming in, right? The fewer the species you have, the more immigration you have. Now let's take a look at both of these lines, right? Look at a near island versus a far island. So a near island has more immigration than a far island. This makes sense because it has easier access, okay? So that's one. Now let's take a look at another graph and we're going to put it together here. Now let's look at the number of species and the rate of extinction. As you increase the number of species, then your extinction goes up. Who has more extinction? A small island has more extinction than a large island. So as the number of species increases, so does extinction. Okay, and smaller islands have a greater rate of extinction. Now let's overlap those two graphs together. Okay, so we're looking at both and we're trying to get the most species richness. In our last chapter, we're going to talk about why biodiversity is so important. Right now we're talking about, we've talked about how to measure biodiversity and, um, and we're going to look at numbers right here and then we'll talk about the importance of biodiversity in our final chapter. So when we look at species richness here, we're looking at where those two graphs that I just showed you overlap. Where do you get the most species? Well, if you have a large island that is close, it's close and it's large, that's where you have the greatest species richness or biodiversity. So on your notes on island biogeography model, the distance an island is from the mainland, right? So the farther away it is from the mainland, the fewer species you have, right? And the size of the island determine the overall diversity. Larger islands closer to the mainland have the greatest diversity. And then this helps us, we can apply what we know about islands to islands that are created by, let's say, roads in an area, right? Because think, think of a road as a barrier. So if you have, let's say, Yellowstone and uh, Park, and you have a bunch of roads crisscrossing, you're making little islands, which then those smaller areas decrease biodiversity. The larger the area, the more biodiversity we have. Okay, so another thing we know about biodiversity, and we've talked about this earlier, is that the closer you are to the equator, the greater the species richness. Do you remember when we talked about um, climate, right, which is a factor of temperature and rainfall? And remember, we studied the different biomes. So the closer you are to the equator, the more biodiversity that you have. So on letter D, um, species increase with a decrease in latitude, where you have zero degrees latitude is right on the equator. So species increase with a decrease in latitude. The closer to the equator, then um, 
the more species you will have, the more species you will have. And those are abiotic factors, right? Temperature and rainfall influencing species diversity. Okay, so now let's start looking at some community interactions. So the first thing we want to review is habitat versus niche. So a habitat is where an organism lives, okay, which, which might be a grassland. A niche is what an organism does there. So here we have grass. That's one species, right? It's a producer. A zebra here is an herbivore, right? It's going to eat the grass. And then we have lions that are eating the herbivores, right? They all play different roles. So a habitat is where an organism lives. It's its home. And an ecological niche is what an organism does. It's its job. Its job. All right. And then we can look at two different types of species, a generalist versus a specialist. So a generalist would be like a raccoon. It can eat a broad range of food, live in various conditions. So it's advantageous because it's a generalist. It can flex. It can move with it, right, when the environment changes. Our specialists are most threatened because they have a very, very narrow range of niches. And so they, when, when the environment is stable, they survive and do well, but they're most susceptible to changes that might happen. So you, you have specialists is a limited diet, tolerates small changes, very, very specific, whereas a generalist can live in a broad range of niches. So varieties of conditions. So these are the ones that become threatened, right? The specialists. Okay, then um, if you look at fundamental versus realized, so um, fundamental is where the broad range it could it could actually exist. So I'm sure this bird right here could live in any one of these areas, right? But realize is where it actually exists. So on your notes, fundamental niche is all the abiotic conditions under which a species can survive, whereas a realized niche where it actually does live is much, much smaller. You might think about your home, right? So you can think of all the rooms in your home. Maybe if you have a large home and you have a dining room, let's say you never go in there, right? So it's there. That's your fundamental home, but your realized home is maybe you're in your bedroom in the kitchen. You know, that's where you actually live, right? Okay, I know that's an oversimplification, but you'll be fine. Okay, competition. Now you can compete within a population, right? So you can have one hyena competing with another hyena, but then you can also have competition between two different species. So competition when members, because we're in the community ecology, right? So when members of different species try to utilize a resource like light or space or nutrients that is in limited supply, that is in limited supply. So what happens? So let's talk about this. The competitive exclusion principle says no two species can occupy the exact same niche at the same time. Something's going to happen. So they either have to divide up the niche or one's going to win and one's going to lose. So competitive exclusion principle, no two species can indefinitely occupy the same niche at the same time. Okay, so what will happen as a result of that? Well, one could replace the other. So for instance, these two paramecium grown separately, fine. But when you grow together, one makes it and the other one dies out. So that's one option. So one replaces the other. One replaces the other. Another option is called resource partitioning, which means instead of the fighting over the whole area. In this case, you could have some take the top of the rock and some take the bottom of the rock. They're, they're separating the area out so there's just a small area of competition. Remember, these are two different species that are doing this. So this is called resource partitioning. Species shift niches. They no longer directly compete. The area of competition has narrowed. It's not the whole rock. It's just this one area. So th this could be variation in timing. Um, it could be like, I'll use the edge of the water at night. You use the edge of the water in the morning, etc. Or it could just be like an actual physical, like I'll be at the new leaves. You'll be at the older leaves. I'll be at the top of the tree. You'll be at the bottom or around the ground. We saw that with the anolis lizard, right? And the resource partitioning there. Um, this can lead to character displacement. So in order to decrease competition and exploit that area of the niche that they're using, um, they can have slight differences like we can see in the Galapagos Islands with finches. So when you have 
three different species on an island, you can see three different beak, beak sizes. Some are smaller, some are medium, and some are larger, so they can exploit their niche. But if you look at the same species right here, it tends to hover right here a little bit, a little bit smaller on its beak depth when it doesn't have the competition of this bird right here. So character displacement, differences in morphology and characters in order to reduce that competition, in order to reduce that competition that is character displacement. Okay, what are some other interactions that can happen in a community? Well, predator-prey relationships. So he's obviously, this beetle is hunting this worm. So, um, so predator-prey interactions is when a predator feeds on prey, when a predator feeds on prey. So some predators to their own demise, like here you can see two different um, eukaryotes fighting it out. And what happens is this one number is high, right? This P caudatum is high. And then when um, this other one comes on, this D nasitum, when he comes along, he starts eating the one that's identified here in blue, this paramecium. He eats them and their numbers drop all the way off. And now he has nothing left to eat. And so then he dies off. So you might see that. That's not good really for either one, or you might see this predator prey cycling and, and it allows them both to survive. But you can see when the prey numbers go up, who then follows, then the predator numbers go up, then the prey numbers go down and the predator numbers go down. Um, so it could happen because the predator overeats the prey or the prey numbers could go down for some abiotic reason, like there could be a drought and so there's not enough food for the prey, so the prey numbers are coming down due to that, which then makes the predator numbers fall. So on your um, cycling, um, I want to give you the classic example. They always show this, okay, is the lynx and the hare. And that's because they have so much data for multiple years. So you can see this snowshoe hare is um, in pink. So you can see when its numbers rise, then what in turn follows right behind it, then the lynx numbers go up. But as the lynx, lynx numbers go up, then the hare numbers go down. So they're those that is that cycling that you saw right here. All right. Next. Um, oh, and you might have you might have uh, for like an exam where you have to measure numbers as a result of that, or what's the timing between these two cycling events. All right. Um, so coevolution. This is when two different species pressure each other. So I'm going to go back to the links in the hair. Right. This lynx chasing down snowshoe hares, this is going to be some directional selection, right? For the snowshoe hare, let's say, to be faster so that he can run away from the lynx, which then you have some directional selection for the lynx to be faster. So they're pressuring each other. That is co-evolution. Okay, trying to be a better predator or trying to avoid being prey. Um, now, there's other coevolution with fertilization and things with flowers and insects. This is just one example here. So, um, on anti predator defenses can result in coevolution. Each of the species adapts in response to selective pressure imposed by the other. So, for instance, um, plants, right? The producers, they do not want to be eaten by herbivores so they can have some anti-predator defenses like leathery leaves and poisons, hormones that make the insects that eat them molt when they shouldn't be molting and, and interfere with their development. Maybe they're going to enter into a symbiotic relationship with ants. So when other herbivores come, the ants will attack them. These would be plants, um, plant defenses. So write a couple down like plants have spines or leathery leaves or poisonous um, hormones, etc. You can add that. Um, another example of a defense is warning coloration. So if you're brightly colored in a forest, you're going to stand out, right? And you think, oh no, you're going to get eaten. Well, the predators have learned don't eat the brightly colored ones because they make you sick or they kill you, right? So don't eat the colorful ones. They want to advertise that they're poisonous so that there is no mistake made. Um, they might try to hide best they can. And if that defense mechanism doesn't work, then in the last second, they might show their, their bright colors to say, okay, for sure don't eat me. And then they'll show that bright color. 
So warning coloration, that would be letter B. Warning coloration. They could also have um, poisonous secretions, right? Um, they could also camouflage themselves. What I think is interesting about this mammal is the coloring of the fur kind of matches the lichen, right, the, uh, the, um, on the rock. And that's pretty amazing to me. Here, um, you can see right here the, the back of this. And these are the legs right here of this little arthropod, this insect. It's some pretty good concealment. Here you can see them on the rocks. So um, for D is C was poisonous secretions and D is concealment. D is concealment. And sometimes predators conceal themselves as well. So can you see the spider right here with the legs? Um, and he's going to eat this. I don't know if that looks kind of like a wasp. Okay. Fright is another way. Um, so if, if a predator comes up, then all of a sudden you're going to blow up and try to startle them. Another way of startling is putting false eye spots so that maybe the predator eats from the wrong end and they can then escape. Um, here, this is the eye. This is like a balloon that gets blown up by this insect and he's creating this false head, which I think looks a little bit like an alligator. All right, another predator defense is mimicry. So this is a fly trying to look like a spider. And so that, you know, any predator might think, oh, it, it could bite me or something like that. And so they don't eat that fly. And it actually moves just like a spider as well. So um, when we look at um, a yellow jacket here, okay, um, it has the coloration, but who else has this coloration, right? Wasps and and um, look like bees and bumblebees, that same black and yellow, black and yellow color. And this kind of increases the learning curve not to eat that type. So on your notes from mimicry, um, anti-predator defense where one species resembles another species or something in the environment resembles another species or something in the environment. So you definitely want to avoid a yellow jacket, right? But this is a flower fly. It has the same coloration as a yellow jacket or a bee. This is called a Batesian mimic. He is tasty and good to eat, but he is mimicking a distasteful species hoping to trick you. So I always think of it like taking the bait. Okay, so Batesian mimicry is one species that lacks defenses, mimics another that has successful defenses, that has successful defenses like a fly trying to look like a spider that I showed you here, or in this case, this fly is trying to look like a wasp. All right, this is a beetle trying to look um, like that same black and yellow color. That's a Batesian mimic. All right, now this is called Mullerian mimicry when you have a bumblebee and um, a wasp and they're all, they all have stingers. This is called the Mullerian mimic. They're both displaceful and they're mimicking each other to increase the learning curve. So Mullerian mimicry is several different species with the same protective defenses mimic one another like bees and yellow jackets and wasps with that same black and yellow color. So the Batesian one is the lie. Mullerian is these guys, wasps, bees, they, and yellow jackets, they have that same black and yellow color and they're both distasteful. They can sting you or bite you. If you're trying to mimic one of those bad guys, that would be a Batesian mimic. All right. Now, symbio symbiosis. In symbiosis, it has to be a relationship between two different species. So, um, and there, it could be a positive relationship for both, or 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 it could be negative for one and good for the other. It always the ones that I'm going to have you, and we've talked about this already in my class. It's going to be good for somebody. It's going to work out for someone. So it's always positive for at least one. Now in parasitism, this is where one organism benefits at the expense of another. So here's a tick on a dog or an old man. I don't know. That's parasitism. And oh, let me help you with the notes there on that. Define close relationship between members of two different species. The relationship is is always good for at least one. Parasitism, I would say mathematically, it's a plus minus, right? It's good for the tick, 
bad for the dog or an old man. I don't know what this is. <laughs> okay. Um, some parasites live inside. This is a tapeworm inside of a dog. Some live outside. This is an ectoparasite. So you might want to jot that down on your notes, usually attached to the host. Okay. Strep throat. If you've ever had that, that's a parasite. Um, leeches can attach on. Now, this is a leech that's getting used for good, not for evil. This finger was um, accidentally cut off. And so what they're doing is they're using the leech to draw blood into the end of the digit to keep that tissue alive so that that reattachment will take. All right, sometimes um, like in Lyme disease, it requires two hosts for this parasite to be transmitted. So here you can see an adult tick feeds, uh, uh, adult ticks feed and mate on this white-tailed deer. And then the female adult ticks lays eggs in the soil. And then the tick larvae feed mainly on this on these mice. Okay, and then the larvae um, can become infected, then the larvae dormant through the winter, and then these tick nymphs can then feed on other animals, including humans, and that's how you can get Lyme's disease. All right, commensalism, this is where it benefits one, the other one it doesn't hurt or harm. So for commensalism, what I would do is plus zero. Um, and in a good example of that is a bromeliad, and it's an epiphyte that lives in the top canopies and jungles, and it and or you can have one in your home too. But it will um, it doesn't hurt the tree that it's living on, but it's higher up, so it's exposed to light, not below the canopy where it wouldn't get as much light. All right, and then mutualism is a plus plus in mathematical terms. So here, this. Um, this, this one is getting cleaned of its ticks, and this one is getting a tasty snack. All right, and then Nemo. <laughs> so this, for the longest time, was thought of as commensalism, that it was good for the clownfish, um, but it didn't harm or hurt the sea anemone, but it turns out the sea anemone um, benefits by the nitrogenous waste that the clownfish gets off, so it's mutualistic. All right, some other examples of mutualistic relationship is bacteria living in your gut um, because they get food and nutrients and they provide us, the host, with vitamins and also take up space so bad bacteria can't live there. Um, this is a classic example about the acacia tree. It provides both food and home for ants inside their hollow thorns. And then when some other herbivore comes to eat the acacia tree, the ants swarm all over that herbivore so they're protecting their claim. All right. Um, lots of cleaning relationships that you can see. So here's a fish literally inside another fish cleaning them out like a dentist. And these are several different cleaning relationships. This one right here is actually one builds the home. It's a shrimp and it lives with a blind goby fish. So they work together. All right. So here's a little um, summary table of that. And feel free to take a screenshot and pop that into your notes if that will help you. And you can see the way these, the expected outcome of this um, species, two different species interacting with each other. All right. Now, continuing on, we're now going to move into community development, like how they develop. And for this one, I just want to review plate tectonics real quick. So we remember that there are these supercontinents over time where all the continents are together. So species can move around those continents when they are connected together. And um, we talked about like the evolution of mammals, that the continents were just uh, starting to break up. Pangaea was breaking up about 65 million years ago, and that's when mammals were evolving, and that's why you have that uniqueness. So we talked about that as an evidence for evolution um, in biogeography, but this also explains why you have certain species located in certain areas even today. So you can look at you, the puzzle pieces of how the continents are together, and you can follow, for instance, this fern that was ubiquitous across all of these um, because the continents were together. So that tells you access to those continents and how those species got there. So underneath um, introduction, I already gave you the review about continental drift and biogeographical evidence of evolution is over in your time. Uh, it, I'm sorry, over biogeographical bio, bio evidence of evolution. And then number two, over time about complex communities evolving in specific areas. 
So sometimes there are disturbances. Um, it could be a fire, could be a disturbance, and that can cause change, but that is not always a bad thing. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. We're going to talk about ecological succession. So ecological succession is defined as a change involving a series of species replacements in a community following a disturbance. Could be following a disturbance or it could just be a normal pattern that happens. So I'm going to differentiate between two types of succession, but I want you to see right here. If let's say the disturbance was a forest fire, when when the plants start to get reestablished, those that are quick to reproduce, fast growing, those are the plants that are going to come first, right? And you're going to see those grasses. It takes longer for those shrubs to develop and then these pine trees and then maybe these hardwood trees. So this would, this would progress over time. So um, here's another example where you have a pond and it's starting to get filled in with plants and then other plants, which is filling in the pond. So there's less space available for water. You might get some eutrophication here, more plants growing in, filling in, becoming a meadow, and then eventually a forest. This would be an example of an aquatic um, ecological succession. So when we talk about um, on land, we have primary and secondary succession. In primary succession, you are starting on bare rock. So this disturbance could be a volcano erupting, killing that life off, and now you have this bare rock. In secondary succession, this is where you already have soil, right? Because in, in this primary succession, there is no soil that has to get generated. And I bet if you know between the two of these, primary, when you start at primary where it's just bare rock, that's going to take a lot longer, right? Secondary succession would be like as a result of a forest fire. So you at least already have soil. So primary succession, start without soil. Start without soil. Um, you're on rock. Um, like a newly formed volcanic island. So when you have that, um, no soil is present, so you have your pioneer species. Those are going to be things like lichens and moss that are going to help to break up that rock and help to create that soil until it reaches um, that stable equilibrium. So, yep, oh, pioneer species, you have the notes for that, that's C, first producers to inhabit a community following a disturbance. All right. Now, secondary succession, this is when you when you have a nice established ecosystem in equilibrium, but a fire comes through and you're back down to the soil again and you go through those stages, but that will be much quicker. So secondary succession is return of a community to the natural vegetation. It has soil. It has soil. And this is a link um, to the changes that happened near um, in California when there was a fire at Pepperdine. So you're welcome to kind of look through that. We'll be going through that in class. So when we look at when following a succession, what species live there to rebuild that community, we need to remember, right? Remember we talked about fundamental versus realized niche, right? You have to look at the range of what abiotic factors you can withstand to reestablish that community. And so you're going to have several different species where, and it's, can they tolerate those conditions to reestablish that community? And so what makes um, a group of organisms live in that place? Most likely um, it's going to be that it meets their abiotic needs. It is the right climate, right? Right amount of temperature and rainfall. And then biotic factors are gonna influence it as well, like competition, right? But it will start also with chance on how that community is reestablished, whether it is terrestrial or aquatic. Usually chance has a big role in that. So on your notes, um, we want to have that it is a complex process that occurs gradually and chance has a great deal to do with the resulting species that colonize, that colonize. And um, so when you have this disturbance, right, what plants first get established is going to be with, you know, what animals have what seeds, let's say, in their feces, or how is the wind blowing? And that chance will bring that to their environment. And if it's the right abiotic conditions, they can become established there. Will they have competition, biotic factors too? Yes, until they reach that climax species for that area.
So there's something called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. This is was studied in Yellowstone with the fires that are occurring there. And basically, take a look at this chart just for a minute and look at community diversity. Now remember, and we're going to talk about this more, the the communities that are the most stable have the greatest biodiversity. So where do you have a peak here in species richness, right? Remember that Simpsons index, how we can calculate biodiversity. Where do you have the greatest diversity? Well, it's not without any disturbances. It's not without any fires. The fires actually can help. But you can look right here on the frequency of the disturbance. You don't want it too much. You don't want to fire every single year in Yellowstone, right? The biodiversity is going to be lower. And you don't want to ever, never have a fire. You need an intermediate amount of disturbance. And then how big it is. You don't want it to be so large that there's no, it's not easy or chance is very low for new speeds, seeds to get there to that area, but you don't want it too small either. So that's the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Um, which says disturbance can be healthy for an ecosystem. Disturbance can be healthy for an ecosystem. <clears throat> All right, so the conclusion is there are several different models about, and we don't need to go into those models anymore, like facilitation and inhibition model. That is not a requirement anymore, but there are several different models that will explain several different models that will explain why the species are living that in that area, but definitely having an, a little bit of a disturbance is going to help with that, as well as chance plays a big roles, big role in what um, species develop in that particular area to develop into that type of community. All right, and so this is the end of part one. In video two, we're going to talk about the dynamics of an ecosystem, and we'll start talking about producers and consumers and decomposers. And if you're one of my students, I will see you in class.